Moshe pays for the little apartment, uh, or helps pay for the little apartment in which she lives, and he, uh, he visits her there, but he comes less and less, and he won't help her in her efforts to rescue her family. He tells her it's, it's hopeless. Early in the relationship, he, uh, he did promise that he would marry her, but he never does, and in the course of the eight years together, uh, she's had two abortions, and now she finds out that she's pregnant again. My mother doesn't tell Moshe, she'll wait. She's heard that after the third month, you can't have an abortion. He won't be able to try to talk her into it again, and if he does try, she'll tell him to go roast with the devil. This baby is mine and I will have it, she'll say. January. She's as tired as if she's been working 24 hours straight, but every day she gets herself out of bed and goes off to the shop. On the train, she's always nauseated. Sometimes it's so bad she has to get off and go into a station bathroom and throw up her coffee and roll in last night's supper. She leaves for work 15 minutes earlier than she used to, so she'll have time to vomit and then catch the next train and not be late punching the time clock. Her breasts are tender too, like they used to be just before her period, but now the tenderness doesn't go away and the bleeding doesn't come. She calculates this might be the end of the third month, maybe even into the fourth. She hears the click of Moishe's key in the lock on a Saturday afternoon. This is the day she'll tell him. Not that she expects him to help her, but he ought to know. He hasn't been around for so long, she's lost track of when she last saw him. He comes in carrying three white roses tied with a fancy red ribbon, like from a nice florist. He's wearing the new pearl gray coat with the collar up, and of course he's raked his black fedora, one side coming low over an eye, that movie gangster look. She used to think it's so romantic, but now it seems only silly, affected. Hey, I missed you, doll, he says, pulling her to him roughly with one hand around her waist. With the other, he holds the flowers high so they won't be crushed. Tell you what, sweetheart, let's go over to the Lethe Lounge and have a couple of drinks, and then I'll take you to a steakhouse for dinner. How's about it? He hands her the little bouquet with a flourish. She accepts it wordlessly and for an instant holds it in front of her, a befuddled bride, before she tosses it down on the kitchen table. She still hasn't said a word. Say, is something the matter, sweetheart, he asks. I'm pregnant again. She makes herself say it without drama. He stares at her aghast and doesn't speak. He looks as he did six years earlier, the first time she told him she was pregnant a man facing the noose. She sees his Adam's apple rise and fall above his collar, beads of sweat already breaking out above his upper lip. She'd like to hate him, though she can't because she's been so long in the habit of loving him, but she thinks he's disgusting. Finally, he says, listen, Mary, don't worry. I'll give you the money to take care of it. For a split second, she's confused. Does he mean he'll support the child? No, of course not. Take care of it means have an abortion. Get rid of it. She folds her hands over her belly, shielding her baby from this man who wants to harm it. This baby I'm going to have, she says quietly. It has taken me a lifetime to understand the strength she had to find and did. A conflagration was gobbling up the light from the world, while the man she loved was good for nothing at all but fiddling. Yet she did not let herself put an end to anguish in a padded cell. She kept her head out of the oven. She got up out of bed every day and kept going. That alone amazes me. And on top of all that, at the age of 43, in 1940, manless and succorless, she proclaimed, this baby I'm going to have. Her courage takes my breath away. Oh, Mama, my hero, I owe you awe. He lets out a long, exasperated sigh. Mary, I'm still trying to figure out what to do with my life. I still have responsibility for my family, and this isn't the time for me to become a father. Anger creeps into his voice, but she's not scared, at least not by his anger. 
You know goddamn well I can't take responsibility for a kid right now, he shouts. I'm not asking you for anything, Morris. She looks him in the eye and he glowers back with hatred, but she won't be shaken. I don't expect anything from you and I don't want anything from you. I want you to have an abortion, he says flatly. I can't. I'm more than four months pregnant. Four months isn't too late. We'll find somebody who'll do it. I'll even go with you this time. Look, Mary, I'm not bringing the kid into the world right now. I'll be bringing it into the world. But if it's here, that makes me its father. He spits the word out. She thinks of her own father, her good Tata, how, he would, how she would jump into his open arms when she was a little girl. Mine Galipsta, my most loved, he would call her. It's my choice and my child, Morris, she says much more calmly than she feels. She knows as though this scene has already played itself out in a dream that now he'll turn on his heel and he'll walk out. And that's exactly what he does. She hears the tap, tap, tap of his shoes on the stairs. She won't call him back. This baby will be hers alone. She stares at the white roses with their stupidly jolly big red bow. She won't let herself cry. And I was born five months later. <laughs>